Wasn't that a great film? Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It was uh, extremely moving, extremely timely, timely, um, and just a beautiful testament to someone who's profoundly important to our culture and to a lot of people personally, which you could tell from um, the way that people spoke about her in the film that I think you captured there. They're just feeling of respect and real deep respect for this woman. But first I just wanna say, congratulations on your recent Peabody Award. <laughs> Which is an incredible achievement. Thank you. For this film and well deserved. And um, it's on top of you know, a Gracie, uh, what other recognitions we have? The More, Television the Academy. Television Award. Academy. Yes. Um, you know, so we're dealing with an award-winning director <laughs> and such a, uh, a really important film that I'm glad that it's gotten this attention. And I want to kind of start there to say, you know, you're getting the recognition, well-deserved finally after a long career as a filmmaker. How does it feel? Well, it feels great. <laughs> I'll start there. Um, and it feels great because um, Rosa's story is so uh, important, as you said, to our, uh, mm -hmm. our country and, and, and the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people know her name, but not her full story. And that is what we wanted to bring forth. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of my own personal career, um, it's, you know, each film is is a different birth and a different mm -hmm. baby. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm so happy to bring that me and my co-director and my team um, have brought forth this film, especially during this time, you know, especially during this mm -hmm. time when there are forces in this country t trying to ban history That's right. um, and, and history that makes people feel mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And literally, you know, uh, this, you know, last mm -hmm. couple of months, they tried uh, a, a um, district a publisher in Florida uh, tried to put for, put forth a lesson plan mm -hmm. about Rosa Parks uh, that omitted race from the story. <laughs> Which so is how so how do you tell like, a story about Rosa Parks yeah. without the race part? Yeah, it's it's so really she just crazy. wanted to sit down on the bus yes, for what? For exactly. It. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> There's that kind of stuff that's happening, which is really crazy. Um, mm -hmm. But it is happening mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. our in our country, not just in Florida. So it mm -hmm. feels so important mm -hmm. that we have this film out now. Um, and we also have a, a, a great education campaign for the film mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the uh, Zen Education Project, awesome. um, who have been you know putting forth uh, Jean Theo Harris's book, which mm -hmm. the film is based on. Uh, licensing for the film. Um, well, they made a young readers edition. Young readers edition for They're the film. They're distributing that That's widely. Right. Yep. Um, and I've seen they have several really interesting lesson plans That's that right. are created by uh, in collaboration with teachers and scholars, experts, activists. Absolutely, yeah. And so, but at the same time, the book is being taken off the shelves in libraries That's across right. the country. Right? Yeah. So it's it's never been yep. more important for this film to be out be out here. Absolutely. I want to talk more about that issue, but first let's back up and tell us a bit about how this project came to you. Let's yeah, I um, came to this project mm -hmm. because of my co-director, mm -hmm. Joanna Hamilton, who is mm -hmm. a colleague um, and you know, documentary filmmaker. And she had connected mm -hmm. with Jean Theo Harris, the okay. author of the book, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. And um, Jean, every year on Rosa Parks' birthday, Jean does a Twitter thread of mm -hmm. all the things you should know about Rosa Parks, but <laughs> don't. <laughs> Brilliant. And Joanna was reading that thread and was like, oh my gosh, these are things that I should know about Rosa Parks, but yeah. I don't. Um, <laughs> and she connected with Jean, um, found out that there had been no feature documentary about Rosa Parks and was shocked, because yeah. that just seems weird. Um, mm -hmm. And she contacted me and was like, hey, you know, um, did you know that there was no feature film about Rosa Parks? I was like, really? And It seems like somebody would have done that. Yeah, it seems like, like somebody obvious. would have done it, exactly. Yeah. And I read the book, 
and um, and I was also shocked about all oh. that I didn't know about Rosa Parks, and re we really felt um, that the time had come for her true story to be told, mm -hmm. um, especially you know in these last few years when we are starting to you know mm -hmm. talk about uh, black women in the movement, which had been something that had been you know not uh, examined or given the you know the given the 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 lens that it needed mm -hmm. needed. Um, and that really her, her time had come. And mm -hmm. so we mm -hmm. joined forces and we went to Soledad O'Brien's production company. Um, they enthusiastically took up the call to get this film made mm -hmm. uh, and we landed at Peacock and that's how, that's how the film was birthed. And then we had to make the film, of course. So if you want to <laughs> see it again, yes. you can access it on Peacock. That's right. And yeah, that's an incredible team and production company. Um, so that's really fortunate that you had that. I think that, you know, it's really um, also important because so many films that are about women of color um, in politics are not well distributed, funded, mm -hmm. or promoted. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so they don't get major names attached or, um, you know, based on like a best-selling book that then gets to have all these iterations of dissemination. So um, it's well-deserved for um, Rosa Parks' uh, legacy and uh, thank God for that. I think um, one thing that I'm really struck by um, is the, the way that you are intervening in this problem of history as being mistold, miscommunicated, mm -hmm. obscured, buried, banned um, <laughs> in this moment. And, and that we've been also living with these myths about not only the civil rights movement being something that black people did somehow between 55 and 65 and then it ended and then it became just black power, which was a di totally different thing with a different cast of characters, right? So we don't get a sense historically about the black freedom struggle that begins the moment of emancipation That's right. through reconstruction and the nadir um, um, period mm -hmm. of the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, how it was mobilized by World War I and World War II because of black veterans, which you're addressing here is so important, right. that that was a major um, uh, kind of mobilizer of black political consciousness and frustration with the status quo, mm -hmm. uh, with black soldiers coming back and saying, I at least deserve respect right. and to not be called boy. I thought that was a profound moment. Um, so we have this kind of... Um, you in this film showing us this is a long-term black freedom struggle that has a lot more continuity than being broken up into something different, into these bite-sized things we call just the civil rights movement. And how we think about that history is also embedded in all these myths about Rosa Parks herself. Mm -hmm, exactly. And I want I think that it's um the first one is really striking. I love at the end of the film where you have this Nancy Pelosi scene where they're revealing the statue. <laughs> you can see this. Exactly. And like personally I have feelings about that statue. <laughs> I don't think I wonder how you feel about it too, but <laughs> she she reiterates the myth that you had just spent the whole film dispelling, which was that she was just tired one day and that yes. simple act of Yes. Sitting down, you know, so there's that. And then there's also this this kind of issue of, um, you know, the fact that she only did one thing mm -hmm. that one time and mm -hmm. didn't have, you know, 40, 50 year career after that. That's right. Plus before. Right. Yeah. So what that implied in which you and you and many people are saying in the film is that she was actually a tactician. Yeah. A strategist. She was a trained activist. So mm -hmm. Could you talk more about you know, how, what it meant to you to dispel these myths and some of the ways in which you tried to make the film do that work. Absolutely. I mean, that was really the point of the film, right? Mm -hmm. That the uh, dispelling the myth that mm -hmm. she did this one thing on this day and that was it. And that was mm -hmm. the end from, you know, beginning to end. Um, I had heard uh, of her work around Reese Taylor um, only a few years before coming onto this project. Okay. So to me, when I learned that, that she was working mm -hmm. 
uh, to you know, expose crimes of black women in the South in the 1940s. I mean, really, really when you think about that and the risk um, mm -hmm. that uh, she took, mm -hmm. literally the, the physical, and she talks about that. You know, we have her mm -hmm. in the film saying, I wouldn't even want to tell you what I went through. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's just really, really intense. Mm -hmm. um, and that she was taking that risk then, and of course had her own experience with um, an attempted sexual assault because that mm -hmm. was something that black women yep. experience very frequently and that mm -hmm. was not talked about. Um, and that she, you know, uh, worked on through the rest of her life. Right. You know, we talk about the Joanne, show the Joanne Little case that mm -hmm. she was a part of in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the fact that after that she was run out of Detroit because of, 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 you know, threats to her life. Mm -hmm. And, but all you the work Montgomery. that- Montgomery. I mean, run out, was that run out of Montgomery to Detroit. To Detroit. Mm -hmm. And all the work that she did in mm -hmm. Detroit, literally mm -hmm. to the end of her life, yeah. right? So that's the other part that you mentioned, that she never was satisfied. She never stopped um, fighting for freedom. And I think that's mm -hmm. what, even at, at times of despair, right. you know, so, during uh, right before the bus boycott, she was very disheartened mm -hmm. with um, the slow pace of what was happening in Montgomery. She felt that the black people were too complacent mm -hmm. in Montgomery um, mm -hmm. and that uh, you know weren't pushing hard enough. And she mm -hmm. was very, very, very um, disheartened. But she kept on going. You know, mm -hmm. she right. says in the during the the riots how, um, you know, that there may be no an end to this problem, mm -hmm. but she kept on going. And so mm -hmm. I feel like that is something that we can learn yeah. from her um, and maybe take some hope of, you know, and, and some inspiration to keep on going, despite mm -hmm. what can feel like very dire times uh, that we're living in right now. I'm glad that you said that. I mean, it's a whole career's worth of activism that she kept going. And, you know, and that she was quite more radical than people thought, right? A lot of people thought because she was aligned with SNCC and LCLC, uh, or really they were aligned with her. Uh, <laughs> so that, I mean, she was there before they exactly. showed up. Exactly, that's right. And then King comes and takes all the credit. Yes. And I just was so stunned. They didn't even fund her. She yes. was unemployed and suffering uh, and really doing without and nobody knew yeah. it came to jet magazine to put an expose so thank god for john conyers and yes drawing attention the important people that did but that is shameful oh it's shameful it is really it's totally the, shameful the amount of money um and attention and travel and accolades and i think that there was this really important moment um you know wanting to speak to this issue about one of the myths you're dispelling is that there's no major black women who were leaders that are important to the, the movement. Um, that scene, the whole thing about the March on Washington was super interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that story about Lena Horn mm -hmm. um, trying to take over the mic and and who else was it who was also trying to get well, attention Well, Daisy Bates was mm -hmm. on. She was the only woman, woman who spoke for just a little bit of time. Okay. Um, and, um, and Lena got up and said, mm -hmm. freedom, that freedom, right. you know, yeah. and that and was, was it. Like nobody wanted yeah. to hear. And Rosa Parks uh, did not speak. She spoke at the, um, there was a, a they, I think it was before the march officially started, mm -hmm. a little thing for women, but it wasn't the official march. Hmm. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that no women spoke at the oh. March on Washington, um, when so many women had been, <laughs> the Annie Lou Hamer. The, yes. I mean, like you All could of, go, you could go on list. and on. Even Coretta. You know? Yeah, others. exactly. I mean, just goes to show you the patriarchy yeah. that um, mm -hmm. and the sexism that was part of the you know of the mm -hmm. the movement. It was a reality. Did you, did you get a glimpse at all from her papers? How she felt about that? She seems so kind of 
just, I mean, just authentically humble. Yeah. I think she should be sainted. Like, I mean, yeah. she's just one of those saintly people that she would never think a bad thought or have, they said, you know, Well, she did say, she, she did say, yeah, she said, you know, we weren't given, she said in her quiet strength way. Right, right. She said, well, you know, women weren't really allowed to speak at the march. Hmm. Like, she knew what time it was, you know? That's right. But also, too, as you said, this was, you know, her personality, and we have, you know, people who say in the film, like, she, her, 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 her strength was in her quietness. Um, she wasn't out there, you know, boastful or looking for accolades. That wasn't her personality. And I also think, too, it was probably also the sub, you know, the, a woman of her time, yeah. uh, where women weren't supposed to do that. That's right. um, and I think that was also part of why she didn't get the credit that she deserved. Not only was she more radical than everybody thought, I mean, because I didn't actually even know the extent to which she supported the New Africa uh, movement and the Black Madonna Church and Malcolm X. That's right. And I think she, like looking at this now, she's really politically was much more aligned to Malcolm. Mm -hmm. And particularly around the issue of self-defense, um, I mean, I think that that was something that was really Martin's project that from his religious studies and his PhD in divinity degrees, that he was studying Gandhi and he was studying these kind of examples um, in the decolonizing mm -hmm. world of this tactical use of nonviolence and the moral campaign right. of how to kind of use nonviolence to manipulate the kind of moral consensus in the country really astutely. Um, but you know, she was a lot more practical having grown up the way she did. Yeah. Can you speak to that? And also how Scottsboro plays a role in radicalizing her. Beliefs. Absolutely, yeah. So we yeah. start the film, as you saw, with her on her grandfather's porch mm -hmm. as he is warding off the KKK with shotgun. That's right. And she says, you know, I wanted him to, to see him shoot mm -hmm. the, the, the Kluxer, the, the Ku Kluxer. Um, this was, but this wasn't unique to Rosa Parks. I mean, yeah. the, um, as we were talking about, the strategy of self-defense was not a strategy. It was a way of survival for black people in this country for, since the time we got here, since the time we were brought here. So right. the fact that we don't talk about self-defense um, is really, where self-defense has always been part of our survival in this country. Yeah. Our, our, our movement gets reduced to, um, and not, you know, I don't say yeah. reduced in a, in, a, um, you know, in a condescending way, but it does get minimized mm -hmm. to a king nonviolent strategy. That's right. uh, and that's never been our only you know, way of moving forward and fighting for our freedom. And Rosa, right. and Rosa uh, Parks' story embodies that because she was, uh, an admirer of Malcolm, yeah. and also obviously an admi admirer of Dr. King. So these right. um, separate silos that uh, you know get pitted against each other. Yes, because they're always pitted. They're always Malcolm pitted, and, and that's that's right. Or Black other. Power, yes. and you know mm -hmm. um, the more respectable. The more respect. Yes, clergy. that's not how mo you know mm -hmm. the, how Black people. Um, for the most part, you know, went about fighting for freedom. It was using, and, and Rosa Parks epitomizes that, using the different parts yeah. that worked. That's right. You know, at different times. And it also seems to be kind of um, space or regional specific, and this kind of, I think it's interesting that we see her in the South doing this particular kind of work, yes. and then in the North, where conditions are similar very similar in terms of segregation and lack of opportunity and all these things, Police but in a violence. different context completely. Yeah. And Malcolm from Michigan, that's and right. New York, you know, <laughs> comes to Detroit and he, he makes sense for that context mm -hmm. in, in a way that he wouldn't have for Montgomery. Yeah. I mean, I had heard about that, you know, my mom used to tell me about that, you know, uh, as a northerner, how, uh, Malcolm made sense, as you just said, yeah. for New Yorkers. She was a New Yorker, yeah. you know, and that's where they were aligned. Um, right. So yes, I think it was, and, and her having both of those, the Montgomery and the Detroit mm -hmm. experience. The issue of self-defense is super interesting and understudied, uh, 
you know, we get those kind of tropes of the Black Panthers as if they were the first ones yeah. to hold guns in defense of themselves. And um, we know that that gets kind of, um, that approach faces major sabotage from COINTELPRO, the mm -hmm. FBI, uh, and the subversion of those groups and declaring them kind of radical and terrorists. And, and, and I think the narrative that we're left with today is really one that evacuates the reason why they felt that they needed to defend themselves. Absolutely. Which was white supremacist violence in the yeah. first place. And I just want to connect that back to something you said earlier about Reese Taylor and Joan Little. Um, I think it's really powerful that we get that perspective because the other thing that's not talked about is all the work that people, particularly women in the movement, were doing to address sexual violence yeah. as, you know, um, indivisible with the rest of the violence of white supremacists. That's right. Terrorism. Well, as we know, black women um, historically were not seen to be able to be violated. Right. right. That was the 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 mm -hmm. stereotype, the trope that was mm -hmm. set up. Yeah. Right. We Unrapeable. Unrapeable. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and of course, you know, that has to do with the whole history of yeah. slavery and, and, and rape and That's all right. that. It's a whole nother. Um, right. So the fact that she and other women were working to expose this yeah. um, and say, you know, black women have historically been mm -hmm. um, violated and raped and abused by, um, by men, by white men in particular, uh, was something, as we said, that was not, you know, that wasn't done. So mm -hmm. to, to do that in the 20s and 30s and 40s um, was, was really an act of, of bravery and risk, like, like risk to your life. And at the same time, they they acutely understand the myth of the black male rapists as also part of the story, right? right? This other kind of the the kind of um, gendering of black men as being you know these super dangerous predators um, that was used against the mm -hmm. child Emmett Till mm -hmm. and the Scottsboro Boys who were That's also right. children, yep. and um, that there was no hesitation to actually kill children based on this false myth That's and right. um, so like the myths that were attached to black women um, you know I, I, I wondered if you've found that her that she was frustrated at all that the she didn't have as much support as she should have at that issue you know we didn't see in her writings um, and which we used you know we deci yeah. decided we wanted her this film told in her words as much as possible so we yes. were able to access her writing, which, at the, which are at the Library of Congress. Yes. Um, and you know, we had Lisa Gay Hamilton, the actress, read, um, and we showed her letters, and um, you know, really figured out how to tell the story in her own voice. And we didn't see her uh, talk about frustration about not having the support. Again, I think it's important for mm -hmm. us to understand the time period that we're mm -hmm. in, right? Like, maybe there was no expectation that she would have that support. Like, mm -hmm. I have to go out and do this and I'm taking the risk and that's, mm -hmm. that's it. Um, because um, those cases were extremely dangerous cases that, you know, um, even, you know, the charges were, <laughs> didn't stick and the- And uh, nothing ever happened nothing to ever the happened. perpetrators. There was no, um, yeah. Resolution. It reminds me, um, you know, recently with um, finally the the accuser of Emmett Till uh, passing away, mm -hmm. who never was held accountable for her lies either. Um, but you know, that's what we're left with. But speaking of this film, you such really. I love the cool techniques that you use visually, and but especially the archival aspects and how you had. Um, were those actually like um, visuals of her diary that you were able to get where the, the, the words were popping off the page that Lisa Gay Hamilton's reading? Yeah, yeah, so they were uh, cool. images from her writing. So we really tried to figure out, right, when you're making a historical, I've done a few historical films at this point, how you make it 
you know, engaging, obviously, contemporary, uh, interesting visually. How do you like bring the archive alive? Really, yes. is the question. Um, and and that was one of the techniques yeah. that we wanted to use. Uh, so you see her writing, her words. Um, mm. Also with like the um, with the photos, right? With the bringing yeah. the photos alive in this kind of three D. Uh, graphic treatment um, can bring, you know, brings you, makes it, makes it feel alive. And so yeah. that's what we, uh, you know, our team really wanted to, to do. How mm. does her life and her work resonate today? And mm. visually, how do you feel that? That's so interesting. Yeah. And uh, so how did you come across um, such rich materials? I was uh, really loved, like there's so much footage I had never seen before, including the first scene with the game show. <laughs> that was really interesting. <laughs> with the real Rosa Parks, please stand yes, up. Yes, absolutely. You know? <laughs> well, I have so to say, you know, as, as I'm sure you know, making a documentary is a team sport. Mm. Um, so one of the first things that we did was mm. hire an archival producer. Okay. Um, when you're making an archival film, that's where you have to start. Like, what mm. is the archive that's out there and what do we have mm. access to? So we actually ended up having a bunch of archival producers. Wow. Um, but, and we also made this film during COVID, like during <gasps> the heat of COVID. So wow. there were some archive houses that were not you know, open or were not open, you know, the Library of Congress was, um, when we first started, they were not, um, you know, their hours were limited. So it was definitely a challenge. Wow. Definitely a challenge. To but make this during COVID on all, on top of it, my yeah, lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You get even more flowers even for that. Even more, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, definitely, yeah. So that's, um, feels crazy now to, to think about that. But yeah, so accessing that archival footage, but it's such a huge part um, of, uh, you know, of the process and, and a whole team is, we're, we're looking for archive and trying to figure out if we can afford it because that's a whole nother aspect mm -hmm. from the beginning to the end. You know, it's, yeah. Well, I, I'm really glad they found that amazing rare material and um, it, was, it was quite interesting. I'm glad that, you know, in that first scene with uh, um, the game show, I was like, oh God, I, I was getting nervous. I'm like, they don't recognize her. And then um, the man that did, what, what's his name? Nipsey, Ru Nipsey, yeah. Nipsey. Nipsey Russell. He, yes, a longtime comedian, entertainer yes. back in the day. And he's like, of course I know Miss Parks, you know, like, <laughs> you Absolutely. need to as well. Yeah. But this speaks to something in our culture that, like, Literally, most people would not be able to point out. That's right. Real historical people, and yeah. figures, important figures in front <laughs> exactly. of Exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's only going to get worse with banning all the books. Oh my gosh! <laughs> like they just, totally. Just kind of increase ignorance. Yes. Speaking of, um, <laughs> the you know the visual approach to the archive, and also making us hear the archive by having an actress, um, a really talented actress, mm -hmm. do um, read from her materials. I, I'm interested in. Um, you know, your experience as a, uh, a black documentarian, uh, telling black stories, uh, being a storyteller through documentary. Mm. You've uh, done several historical films on The Green Book, on black women entertainers, right? On, on Harry Belafonte, Rest in Peace. Mm -hmm. um, some really, really important work, Yoruba. And I think that... Um, I just want to speak to like, you know, the genre of documentary and your approach to storytelling of this story, of our history. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I didn't intend to do a lot of historical films. That wasn't what, when mm -hmm. I started. That's not, uh, you know, was my goal. Um, I've, of course, I've always been a lover of history and, um, when I find something mm -hmm. out, so uh, some of these films have come to me, like people have approached me mm -hmm. to direct. Some I've, you know, generated from my own inspiration. Um, but when I am come across something that I didn't know, that especially when I think I should have known it, mm -hmm. I'm immediately intrigued because mm -hmm. I feel like if I didn't know it, mm -hmm. then maybe other people didn't know it, and maybe there is something new to tell about it, 
right, in a way that's revealing or in a way that hasn't been told right. before. So that's where I start. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, the approach is really, it's not scientific, it's really like a feeling, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm reading a book or an article or hearing about something and I'm like, oh wow, this could be a film. And it's like gut, it's like guttural, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, and you start to see it visually. And you start to see it visually, yeah. And you start mm -hmm. to see like what it could be and what your mm -hmm. thesis could be, like what your premise is, okay. you know. Um, and then you, you know, then you go through the work of trying to figure out, you know, who could I interview? Do I have access to them? How can I raise the money for this? Mm -hmm. Where would this, who, who would this, you know, what audiences would this appeal to? Mm -hmm. All those questions. Um, yeah. What's your favorite part of the process? Um, coming to places like this and screening and having conversations <laughs> when, it's, like... when all the work is done. Um, and we had a nice dinner. And beforehand. we had a nice dinner before. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, no, I mean, I really do love all parts of the process. And that's actually when I first, you know, made my first video. It was um, because realizing that I loved all the parts of the process, mm -hmm. loved the, you know, the interviewing, the uh, research about the topic, um, being in the edit room and trying to figure out how to tell the story, mm -hmm. what music am I going to use? Um, so I don't know if there's a favorite part. I guess, you know, one of the un most unfavorite parts is can be trying to raise the funds. And, and, and that can be very, um, you know, that can just be challenging just because of the nature of, of the film business. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if there's a favorite. I, I really do like all parts of it. And, and I emphasize, like for me, um, the team, one of the favorite parts is like working when you're working with great people and everyone's putting their heads together to try to figure out how to tell this story and that mm -hmm. synergy. That's okay. really one of my favorite parts. And that can come that you know, from the development part, it can come in the uh, production part when you're trying to figure out the story. Um, so yeah. Mm, so it is really a team effort. It is a team effort. And I was wondering about, <laughs> and this relates to the funding as well, but um, you know, do you feel that other people share your sense of urgency in getting these stories out there, you know? Um, is there more support than, you know, 10 years ago or so like that for a film like this to be possible? Um, because it feels like it's not just, you know, minoritized people who are at the brunt of the kind of politics that are happening, but everyone's really upset about it across the board. I think it's gotten to a place that just reasonable people yeah. feel uh, like w something's going wrong and we need to kind of, um, you know, uh, address history in a more fair way. And yeah. uh, it's, and that we're entitled to, um, to tell our stories and to reveal that history, like the 1619 Project mm -hmm. started a lot of the controversy around critical race theory, uh, what's happening in Florida right now. Yeah. And I think the intersection of the kind of don't, gay, don't say gay bill and anti-trans youth, anti-drag queen, anti-reproductive justice, and anti-black history are all connected in a way, right? Absolutely. It seems like uh, we're in a really um, complicated moment. And I wonder how you read that urgency in shaping your work and if, it's, if you feel like things have been changing because of that. Yeah, I mean, I'll even go back a little, uh, in, in some ways, we're kind of always at this moment, right? Like, we know the history of this country. We know right. the history, right? It's of true. course, now all these things, as you just outlined, it are happening. It always feels like an emergency. Yeah, exactly. Mike Brown, yeah, George yeah. Floyd, all, whatever. You know, so, and that's historically, you know, what our reality is in this country. Yeah. Um, but also, too, just to add that uh, the media landscape, right? So I started in this business in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. I actually was over in the news side for a while too. And I was there when the news started, um, you know, condensing and, and, and um, becoming more about a business as opposed to news. Mm. And with that, um, I feel like I saw the, the, how documentary 
um, started to grow and really yes. became a place where people started to get information. I'll never forget um, in like tw 2007 or six or whenever that was with Michael Moore's film, um, uh, Fahrenheit 9-11 okay. and being at a movie theater and this was, you know, we were in the war and I remember seeing this huge long line for Fahrenheit 9-11 at a movie theater and I was like, wow, like <laughs> things are, totally. like this is, di this feels totally. different, right? It did. Um, and then of course it, we had the, then of course we had streaming and the growth of, um, you know, what they mm -hmm. call the golden age of doc when all these people were looking for content. So there was a, mm -hmm. a technological thing that happened, a contraction of the news That's right. that happened, mm -hmm. which, and people, um, and I teach as well. Mm -hmm. I teach, I created the documentary film program at the City University of New York. Fantastic. And they, you know, and it, when I started teaching is when young people started seeking out documentaries. They were like, you know, this is what I watch. This is what I, so all these things started mm -hmm. happening. Um, and, you know, now we're in another, you know, sort of interesting moment about um, economically and blah, blah, blah. And we'll, we'll see where things sort of, uh, you know, pan out. But I do think documentary has become a place where people go to seek information and clarity um, mm -hmm. about things and issues and people. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. We uh, really appreciate you guys staying uh, this evening for the conversation and coming out for the film. And I'm just so pleased and grateful for you coming so far and being with us. Um, your work is brilliant. You're absolutely uh, incredible. And uh, you have friends at UCSB yes. for good. So come back and see us I'd anytime. We're happy to screen for you. And everyone, please give Yoruba Richen a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>